It is with uh, great honor and pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Brad Olson. Uh, and just a little bit about Dr. Olson. I'm reading, I want to make sure I get everything right here. Uh, Dr. Olson is a community psychologist uh, and associate professor at National Lewis University in Chicago. And he's been involved in the struggle uh, within, uh, within psychology specifically and the American Psychological Association, or the APA, um, around the issue of torture and interrogation for the last 10 years. Um, Dr. Olson co-founded co the Coalition for an Ethical Psychology and has been president of Psychologists for Social Responsibility, the Peace Psychology Division of the APA, and the chair of Divisions for Social Justice, a collection of 12 divisions of the APA. His research and scholarly work is on the connections among psychology, the social sciences, ethics, and human rights. And he and others do evaluation and consulting uh, work with organizations such as Habitat for Humanity International. Um, so it is with my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Brad Olson. Thank, thanks so much, everyone. Is this on? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So everyone can hear me well, or what? Oh, just you. So I should be using this. Try, try this. Do you want? Would you rather use that? Um. I'll take the hand out. Okay. Yeah. So I hope most of you have, have finished lunch because torture in lunch is torture is not a great uh, lunchtime conversation. Um, I, I I love this title um, and it's it's not my uh, uh, Lauren and Charlie helped me with this title. Uh, Insularity, injustice, and the necessity of interdisciplinarity to socially just disciplines. The case of the APA interrogations, torture, and the Hoffman Report. So throughout community psychology, we all kind of know of UW Bothell as being the place for uh, interdisciplinarity, or as I heard at the lunch table, transdisciplinarity, or um, don't ask me the difference between all of these things. But um, this, is, uh, this is not a research project. It's more of, of uh, quite a few of us psychologists coming into uh, realizing that we're also activists. And I think from a community psychology perspective, I mean, even earlier this morning, I, I heard uh, great conversations about the student protests here and, and um, all the good things that are happening. So um, I'm going to kind of tell it a, a little bit more as a narrative, but all of this work that I sort of accidentally got into and my close colleagues accidentally got into we, 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 we were really sort of dragged into it because we were so angry at what our discipline was doing. So we really felt like they're not going to do this to psychology. But the more I've thought about this work, working on this issue for over 10 years, I thought, what's different about some of us who are working on one side of the issue versus those who are working on the other side of the issue. And my hypothesis, one hypothesis, is that a lot of us who are more on the social justice side of things, that we think more about history. We think more about the risk that the US could get into uh, in terms of becoming a future Nazi Germany. We um, think about politics. And I think, I think part of the problem with uh, an insular field like psychology often can be is, is traditional psychologists get this training, training, training to think about individuals. And it's sometimes hard to break out and see the bigger picture. And I think that insularity leads them into a path that is basically, um, well, you'll hear the story here if, if, um, if, if you don't know about it already. Um, but first, I wanted to, just from a community psychology perspective, what, what is community psychology? And, and, and I, I think community psychology, I mean, one of its most important principles is uh, interdisciplinary, that we embrace all kinds of different fields. And the groups that we've been sort of 
who have been on the other side are what, what we've been calling adversarial operational psychologists, who are, are um, doing, I think, quite a bit opposite of what we community psychologists believe in. So for instance, we believe in empowerment. We believe that we don't empower people, but through collaborative dialogue and work together, there's an empowerment process that occurs. We're about sense of community. And a lot of what the adversarial operational psychologist got into was we are actually going to disempower people. We are going to engage in learned helplessness and focus on that target and try to break that target down, try to wreck any sort of sense of community and, and feeling of social support. Um, we're about collaboration and prevention and increasing well-being and these psychologists were intentionally using our tools to uh, dislocate people, to uh, use techniques like fear up harsh, and their interventions were not about well-being, but were about harm. Community psychology is, is not about looking at, at people for, uh, uh, from diverse cultures and groups. We look at them, their strengths and assets. We don't just look at negative diagnoses. But at the same time, we also have a critical liberation orientation where we are going to take on the unjust power structures. We think about ecology, so again, not getting stuck with the individual, and we embrace our values. It's not all about being objective and being in laboratories and doing one-on-one -on -one therapy. We're also about getting into the community and believing that we actually hold values of human rights, that values of ethics and morals, and that we're going to do something about it. So, um, so I think that's part of what makes us different from these other psychologists. So just looking historically, we all know after 9-11, uh, the nation changed permanently. Um, and some, some of us say that it didn't change at all. Uh, but we know Abu Ghraib, um, Guantanamo Bay, the CIA black sites in places like Thailand and Poland, uh, torture was going on. And um, part of what my colleagues and I did when uh, we started to pay attention to all these issues is we, we started trying to uh, investigate what's, what's happening and what are psychologists doing. And in cases of CIA waterboarding, uh, we eventually found documents that showed that in every case of CIA waterboarding, a psychologist had to be present. And the reason psychologists had to be present was because of the laws around what is torture, that, that the Bush administration, the U. Bybee memos, set up basically saying that if it's only torture if post-traumatic stress disorder is developed. So if you have a psychologist who's there and saying, okay, stop, because if you go further, you're, you're going to create PTSD, then uh, they could always stay within that line of torture, even though, of course, we know that's um, completely false. But, but that was the sort of legitimization process that the, the, the role of the psychologist played. It wasn't even that they needed the psychologist. They did use psychologists for other ways to get information. But um, psychologists were also just defending unjust policies. So around this time, uh, I mean, the US has always been engaged in torture uh, through the CIA in hidden ways. Um, but this was the first time that it was sort of becoming uh, acceptable. And the idea that physical torture would leave marks, but that psychological torture is invisible and therefore, uh, if, if they engaged in it, they could get away, away with it. So the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association said uh, physicians and, and psychiatrists have no place in interrogations, national security interrogations. But what the APA has always been about since World War II is competing with psychiatry. So they have a big effort to get psychologists uh, to be able to give prescription privileges. Seymour Saracen, the, the community psychologist, said psychology has always been the handmaiden 
of psychiatry. And so part of the problem with the American Psychological Association is they always want to compete and try to gain advantage over psychiatry and they saw this as an opportunity. The Department of Defense, the CIA, post 9-11 had all kinds of money and all kinds of power. So the more that psychology could be in line with the CIA and with the Department of Defense, the better. Um, so the American Psychological Association came up with the, what's called the PENS Task Force, which was a task force to examine the ethics of interrogation. And so I was a chair of this Divisions for Social Justice that Charlie mentioned at the time. And then we heard about this task force and we looked at the composition of the task force, which uh, we only found um, through looking through internet channels that were very, very difficult to find. And, and it was the majority of the task force was made up of uh, military members who we later realized were in the exact chain of command in places where the torture was occurring. So um, to, to jump to the future, to jump to today, I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit about the Hoffman Report. But the Hoffman Report was an uh, investigation that the APA did. And um, ultimately, we now know that that Penn's task force report that endorsed psychologists' role in these interrogations, that that report was essentially written um, uh, with the help of the CIA, with the help of the Department of Defense, before the task force even came about. So the task force was sort of this just mock task force. So the members, psychologists, everyone was deceived by this process. So um, let me just say a little bit more about what the psychologists were supposedly doing. So the biscuits, these are behavioral science consultants or behavioral science consult, um, consultation teams. Their jobs at places like Guantanamo Bay was to guide the interrogations, locate vulnerabilities in detainees, and strategize techniques to gain information. And as I'll, um, I'll show you later some specific examples of their way of locating vulnerabilities and and exploiting people, which um, do not exploit as part of the APA ethics code. So um, they also designed the organizational settings. They um, designed the conditions, the reinforcement punishment paradigms, removal of toilet paper and other items. Um, so I mean, it was this whole system that was very much like the Milgram experiment or the, uh, or the Zimbardo um, Stanford prison study. They were also, these biscuits were also supposedly acting as safety officers. They were protecting the detainees from other interrogators. But again, as I mentioned earlier, that safety officer role was there to basically say, okay, you're not torturing. You're just engaging in uh, cruel and human, in, inhuman, inhumane and degrading treatment. So eventually over time, uh, because of this Penn's task force and this report, the Department of Defense eventually said, uh, for this biscuit role, um, we're only gonna have psychologists. We're not gonna have psychiatrists. So the American Psychological Association got what it want, wanted. The CIA Department of Defense got what it wanted. They got psychologists to continue um, engaging in interrogations. But I mean, from a community psychology perspective, there are all kinds of stakeholders. There's all kinds of different levels of organization. There's the APA intelligence, Department of Defense, there are um, all kinds of different characters. If this, um, you know, I've been doing this so long, if it, just jump in and ask a clarification uh, uh, question if, if I'm not clear. Um, but some of the things that we heard along the way, one uh, uh, gentleman who was a uh, lieutenant colonel who was a psychologist in front of the American Psychological Association Council when they were gonna make one of their big changes, he basically said, if psychologists are not at Guantanamo, people will die. So that's the safety officer argument, that if, if psychologists aren't there, people will die. And uh, Moses and I, just a, a little while ago, we had that conversation about when do you work inside a setting, 
to create change, positive social change? And when is a setting so fundamentally um, a, a violating human rights that you're better off fighting from the outside? And our belief uh, in this case, if Guantanamo was that bad that people are going to die because the psychologists aren't there, it's time to really do some social action that says this has to stop. So one of the Surgeon General from the Army uh, at a debate with Physicians for Human Rights, uh, um, Len Rubenstein, uh, the Surgeon General of the Army said, well, if the detainees would just tell us what we want to know, there would not be a problem. So there would not be a problem with torture if, so I mean, we all know that, that a fair public trial, so did they have information or not? But it's this assumption that we have these detainees and um, they're just not cooperating. And that's why we need the psychologists. And then the APA president, uh, who played a big role in the APA task force, uh, he sort of aggressively on, on a listserv uh, said, terrorists will be killed on the battlefield and never know psychologists had a hand. So it's this sort of uh, weaponization of, of psychology and, and the fields that um, was a, a lot about guild interests and a lot about just protecting and building the field of, of psychology. So there were many, I mean, there were at least 40 people who have been psychologists who have been very active on this issue for so long. But um, my colleagues in the Coalition for Ethical Psychology, uh, Jean Maria Arrigo, she was on that Penn's task force and she was a whistleblower and said something is wrong here and she was viciously attacked by a number of, uh, verbally by a number of the members, just you know, one of the bravest women I know. Trudy Bond is kind of the, our accountability person. She's the one who filed the ethics complaints against the psychologists at these places and followed those up for years and years and years. Roy Eidelson, uh, um, brilliant writer, thinker, Roy was just fundamental in our annulment campaign where we tried to basically have a campaign that said the Penn's report and that policy doesn't hold now and it never existed. Stephen Reisner, uh, um, apparently he's in the documentary that, that's uh, coming up, he's a uh, commentator in that, uh, Stephen's charming, so we had him run, he ran for APA president and got very close, I ran about three times and got very close and hopefully we'll get him in there one of these days. And Stephen Soltz, uh, databases and databases of all the investigatory material that we put together to try to, try, try to figure out what's going on. And then Brian Welch, he eventually joined us. He's an attorney and psychologist. And Brian was the first, uh, the first head of the practice directorate, the big clinical section of APA. And so he used to be with APA, so he was an insider. And so he had tons of useful information. And uh, my, I think <clears throat> my major role was mostly investigations, doing uh, uh, Google searches. But every year we moved the policy a little bit, but APA was resistant again and again. So in 2005, there was the Penn's policy. Then in 2006, they made uh, reaffirmation against torture. With this issue, everyone is against torture. No one is for torture. But just saying uh, we're against torture is not enough. Then they restricted cert certain techniques that psychologists could not engage in these specific techniques. And then we filled in loopholes. And then one of the, the biggest efforts that um, Dan Albers, myself, and, uh, and Ruth Fallenbaum, we engaged in this referendum policy. We knew APA's internal counsel they're uh, all the representatives from every state and all the 50 some divisions that they were not going to side with us. They were not gonna ch change the policy. We saw that everywhere. So we went to the membership. We got enough signatures. Um, APA, uh, I wrote a, a pro statement. Someone else wrote a con statement and um, our referendum passed, which basically said that in national security sites, 
that, uh, that, that violate the Constitution or international law, psychologists may not be there. Um, military psychologists um, must not be there. The only psychologists that could be there are working uh, independently as a third party only for the well-being of the detainees. So that was sort of an attempt to just get them completely out of the settings, since there was no monitoring that could be done inside Guantanamo. And that was pretty controversial because others wanted, to, wanted us to just say no interrogations. So there's the psychologists cannot be at the settings at all versus psychologists cannot be in the role of interrogator. And uh, just this year, which is our big victory, was that both of those policies now hold. So um, that referendum won. That became APA policy. But APA just then said, well, Guantanamo isn't violating human rights anymore, um, which it, it clearly is. Uh, even though m many of the interrogations stop because, of course, there's, there's no information um, that can be gotten from the detainees now. Um, and I'll, we, we also did state legislative efforts. We changed a loophole in the ethics code that basically said this uh, 1.02, the standard 1.02 basically said that if there's a conflict between the ethics code and the law or a, 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 law or a governing authority, that the psychologist may follow the law or governing authority. And so um, this was basically, if the Department of Defense is saying, no, you have to do this, that's our rules, they would have to abandon their ethics code. So we uh, changed that section of the policy to say, um, uh, except in no circumstances may you follow uh, this law or governing authority um, if it's in violation of human rights. So, and then we've tried to uh, change some uh, state level legislation to try and um, ensure that if, if people who engaged in torture came back to their state and wanted to have a clinical license that they could not get it. Um, I told you about, a little bit about the annulment of pens. And then uh, things started to change when Again, through investigations, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but essentially um, we found some really good information, brought it to Jim Risen, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winner of the New York Times, and he published uh, this piece, and he has a, a chapter in his book on this issue where he really takes on APA. And that's when the APA, the APA started to go after Risen and contradict him, and he went back after them, and that's when they hired this independent investigator, um, David Hoffman uh, from Chicago, and, uh, and that's the Hoffman Report. That's a 500, I think, 40-page report some of you may know about. Okay, so um, kind of going back in a time, this is, this is what the APA Ethics Office and the presidents were saying about accountability. Uh, so the APA president says, APA has taken a very strong stance against torture, so on, so on. If anyone is able to identify APA members who are involved, we will take disciplinary action. And we did have APA members who were clearly, clear documentation that they were involved and they didn't act. Um, so the president also says, I've asked for names so that APA can investigate its members. No names have ever been forthcoming. We gave them names the names and the evidence hundreds of times, particularly Trudy Bond. The head of the ethics office, who ends up being the real villain in the Hoffman report, says, when we have the facts, we will act on them. If an APA member, we will address violations directly and clearly. Now, they knew James Mitchell, uh, the architect of the CIA torture program in the CIA black sites in, in, uh, in Thailand, that and some of you might have heard recently on the news that he's being sued by the ACLU and some of the detainees. Um, he was an APA member until 2006, and the head of the ethics office knew that and, and never acted on, uh, on any, any complaint. So another, another figure along with uh, James Mitchell was uh, John Lesso, who was at Guant Guantanamo Bay, and he was a biscuit, 
And we had the logs, uh, the research, the descriptions of the torture, the interrogations, where um, this figure, al Qatani, this individual, was really um, psychologically abused consistently. Fear up harsh, I mean, times where he was just uh, breaking down, crying, you know, and just showing all sorts of symptoms of mental illness and, uh, and just um, absolutely psychologically breaking down, and yet the biscuit says, um, keep going. So Lesso also devised this memo, along with this psychiatrist, uh, that what he was, Lesso was against the physical techniques. He was for the psychological techniques. So strict isolation for 30 days. If you can, you know, the thinking was that if someone gets that alone and alienated, they're going to want to talk to the interrogators. Removal of all comfort items, exposures to extreme temperatures, cold weather and water, scenarios of making detainee think he would experience painful or fatal outcomes. So even the con convening authority at Guantanamo, uh, the military commissions, the head said the Interrogation of al Qatani uh, clearly met the legal definition of torture, and she would not even um, prosecute the case because it was so clear. Um, so his interrogation, uh, all aspects of detention conditions should enhance, capture, shock, dislocate expectations, foster de dependence, and support exploitation to the fullest extent possible. So given our ethics code of do no harm, of uh, beneficence, of uh, don't exploit, um, this is what was happening. Strip, standing naked with female interrogators, um, forcing the detainee to perform dog tricks, and terrorized by military dogs. So the head of the ethics office delayed after Trudy Bond and others submitted uh, these complaints. It was six years later, supposedly because the ethics director wanted more information to come out. After six years, uh, just last year, I believe, um, the case was closed because there was not preponderance of evidence, despite all of this, despite the logs. And so he never even sent it to the whole ethics committee. He and the chair decided, um, no, the case was never opened. But that's where some of our Oh, I call it investigative psychology, but it's really investigative journalism. Uh, we were persistent, and so I was, this was very early on, we were working with an, uh, a writer from Vanity Fair who was writing on the topic, and I was looking at uh, Rand Corporation. Rand Corporation does all kinds of good substance abuse and other evaluation studies, and Rand um, had this very kind of sort of dark, uh, detention, Guantanamo type study, and I called someone up I knew who was a substance abuse researcher, and I said, what is this? Is Rand doing this type of work? And he's like, oh yeah, I don't even, you know, I don't, I don't even go down that side of the hall because it's, uh, it's so creepy. It seems like Holocaust type stuff. And he's like, but I know a guy who works over there. Do you want to call him? And so I got his phone number. His name was Scott Gearware. And I mean, this was a very manic, enthusiastic guy throwing uh, intro to psychology ideas about how to make Guantanamo better. And so very talkative. Eventually, um, I passed him over to one of our Physicians for Human Rights colleagues. And um, then on uh, a Hollywood freeway, he was, uh, LA freeway, he was uh, hit by a dump truck on his motorcycle. And, um, and so he died, and our Physicians for Human Rights colleague uh, talked to his, um, his partner, his widow then, and uh, got his emails. Um, and that's when we saw uh, Gearware was part of uh, the American Psychological. They had conferences with the CIA on deception, on um, when can psychologists or clinical psychologists, when can they report terrorism? What type, of, uh, what type of drugs? Are there any true serums out there? Um, 
Scott Gareware was a big part of those, setting up those conferences. And so we saw from the inside for the first time that all of the things that we suspected were true. So some of the things that we found out, one APA official who's very high up in the science directorate said to a CIA psychologist who had clearly been working with them before this PENS ever occurred, he said, APA grabbed the bull by the horns and released this PENS task force report today. I also wanted to semi-publicly acknowledge your personal contribution in getting this effort off the ground over a year ago. So the CIA figure uh, ended up getting the Penn's task force off the ground. Your views were well represented by very carefully selected task force members. All of the Department of Defense people that I told you about earlier. So essentially, the CIA's views were very well represented. And um, we, we, there were all sorts of pieces to this, these Gareware emails. So um, James Mitchell, for instance, the, the architect, they wanted to get him back to one of these conferences. And, he's, and, and, and one of the APA officials, the same APA official, says, no, um, I don't think we're going to get James Mitchell to our conference. He's in a very special place doing very special things to very special people. So what does that mean? I don't know. But there was enough to suspect that APA knew, knew what was going on. Um, so the Hoffman report, we were very worried that this was just, APA was paying for this. They, they spent, I don't know, something like $6 million to have this report from this investigator um, who worked at Sidley Austin in Chicago. And um, I met with him for a couple hours uh, in his building. He seemed like he was authentic, but it's always hard to tell. And, but APA apparently, some people there were very serious about once they had that face off with the New York Times, they had to do something. And so they hired Hoffman. And um, here are some of Hoffman's report conclusions. And I kind of switched these around. I put number one, uh, this is my favorite part, is that the critics' understandings of pens was correct. So um, that felt very good. There's other things that he disagreed with us on. So for instance, we had that CIA evidence. He didn't see anything in that CIA evidence. Um, but so Hoffman said, APA officials colluded with DOD officials. They loosened the APA ethics code. And by doing so, they added a layer of protection to already porous legal constraints. So had it all gone differently, um, this would have been, some of this, Hoffman believed, could have been prevented. So psychologists would have had, had a more difficult time harming the detainees if the ethics director, the president, uh, one of the biggest conflicts of interest was that the head of the, the practice directorate, at this, there was this debate between Kevin Kiley, the Surgeon General, and Len Rubenstein. And I went up to the Surgeon General of the Army afterwards, and I said, yeah, what do you think about these biscuits? And he's like, oh, uh, this one, yeah, I just talked to this one Donovan. They're, they're great. And so I wrote down that name, Donovan, and just kind of talked about it, because finally we had a name of a biscuit. Turns out she's married to, uh, was married to the head of the practice directorate, who had a huge influence on the Pence Task Force. So a, a biscuit, a Guantanamo, de, uh, Guantanamo Bay biscuit is married to someone who had a big influence on the task force. So I mean, the conflicts, he was eventually fired from APA and then, or he was quietly let go from APA and then um, after the Hoffman report was um, fired from Alliant University. Um, so, but uh, given the collusion, psychologists, APA's actions, allowed psychologists to use their skills to do harm. APA's principal motives were to curry favor with the DOD, create a good public relations response, and keep the growth of psychology unrestrained. So it was, it's power, greed, money, I mean, nothing we should be too surprised about. And then Hoffman's message to the profession was that psychologists do have a special skill that can heal or damage psyches. When the profession allows for the infliction of pain on those with an inability to resist, 
the faith in the pr profession can diminish quickly. The profession of psychology itself must define uh, what is ethical and legitimate. APA bylaws says its responsibility is not only to advance the profession, but to hold the highest standards of professional ethics and conduct. And that idea of ethics and human right as, as a protection that we really need to infuse in all of our disciplines and have social scientists and everyone in academia to, to really push human rights and ethics, I think it's something that's gonna prevent this type of thing from happening ever again. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. So we can open it up to the floor. We have some time for questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions uh, that you're interested in asking uh, Dr. Olson, now is the time. So raise your hand and I can come over with the mic to you. That was a lot of information, wasn't it? I, were you able to follow any of that? Or was that? Thanks. I, I, I know many of us probably really appreciate just knowing the history of what took place here and how, especially how hard it was for you to dig it up. Can you give me just a little more detail on exactly what happened with the senior leadership of the APA. Uh, I know there was turnover, and what, what was the turnover, and what was the link to this? Sure, so, so after the Hoffman report came out, um, the APA, I mean, we thought, wow, we finally won. We, we've got these policies passed. The American Psychological Association is gonna change. And there was some, some small change. So the ethics director, who was the real villain in the, pen, uh, the, the Hoffman report, he was fired. The CEO uh, retired early. The head of the science directorate uh, uh, left as soon as the Hoffman report was, um, was, was started. And then um, and one of the uh, public relations person also retired early. So um, there was a lot of turnover, but these are, I mean, psychological cultures of these organizations do not change easily. And so, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is really just beginning. We're seeing so much, so many signs of backsliding and, uh, and just suspicious new, new policies that, uh, that looks like it's going to go on for much longer. So um, I was going to ask, uh, with regards to the, uh, to the structure, you know, how bureaucratic it is and how it's set up, uh, it, it, it appears like this was one of the issues, you know, like what, given uh, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic nature of the CIA and how it's governed, uh, what is the ultimate goal, I would say? of the uh, human rights activists? What, what should they hope for yeah. in a system like that? Yeah. You know? um, well, there's, there's a, lot of, a, a lot of answers to that question. So, so what are our next steps and how are we gonna take this beyond the American Psychological Association? So, so we'll still be working to change the American Psychological Association and psychology. We're also, we had a meeting in Boston a couple weeks ago to create a broader set of ethical guidelines that would uh, all military psychologists, whether they're engaged in uh, psyops and propaganda, whether they're engaged in interrogations, whether they're trying to get soldiers back into the theater, even if they have PTSD, all of these sort of, uh, or if it's about training to kill people better, um, all of these activities, we came up with a broader set of guidelines. So that's one area. We're trying to broaden this out beyond interrogation. Um, but the CIA and their sort of culture and mission is much different than Department of Defense. So the CIA structure is, um, there's, there, it, in, in the military, there's a lot of honor and ethics. And, and, and um, so 
uh, one, of, one of the persons at the conference, we brought together military, CIA people, and some of the dissonance on this APA piece, and, um, and our uh, one guy who, was a, who leaked information, John Kiriakou, CIA, former CIA, he basically said, oh yeah, we need psychologists because uh, you guys have an ethical code. We don't, the CIA, we don't have ethics. So um, the CIA is gonna be tougher to change. Um, but of course the Department of Defense will be tough to change too. But we're thinking that there are some possibilities to allow psychologists to follow their ethics code, to um, be able to say no within the military and be independent health providers or whatever their role is. Um, maybe I watch too much television, but at any point in this process, it sounds like what you're doing takes a lot of courage on this entire coalition in partnering and with the power structures that this Hoffman report has already changed and with all of your work, were there any points along the way where you were concerned for your safety? And after the report came out, has that changed at all? Has there been pressure to your jobs, pressure to stop what you're doing? Well, uh, uh very early on, we were, we were a little bit worried about our safety and we were kind of like, you know, um, uh, eventually we kind of all, the coalition members all together said, okay, you know what, we're just, you know, we're not, we're not going to worry about our safety. And, you know, I mean, that's, I, that's a good thing still about our government, at least they're not going after us. And, and um, but I mean, there are times I, where I've been told, um, I applied for a position and I was told that the clinicals, you know, by the students afterwards, um, you know, I gave an interview and there's all kinds of reasons I might not have gotten it. But, you know, it clearly came out that the clinical psychologist said that this is too risky we, um, to hire him. We have our APA accreditation needs and if he's causing problems with the APA, you know, that's going to be trouble. So, and I've heard that, at a, heard that at a couple schools, but eventually found my way to my favorite place in the world, so. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, uh, um, I mean, there's always that decision about risk. And, uh, but it's also so fun, kind of, uh, working with your friends and, uh, and, and investigating this and, and uh, pulling apart the, you know, looking at the puzzle pieces. But thanks, yeah. My question actually is related to what you just said as someone who's been affiliated with APA training programs, whether it's internship or doctoral programs. I mean, we want to keep our APA accreditation. The students want us to keep our APA accreditation because it's so tied to licensing. So how do we as faculty continue to mentor future psychologists to empower them to be more active and, and find ways to really be on guard and looking for these issues? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, 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 is, it is risky. It's particularly risky for students, of course, um, to be engaged in this type of thing. But there's also... There are so many different ways of engaging in activism. And we, one thing Jean Maria Arrigo, uh, the rest of us were always to have like this huge sarcasm in all of our open policy statements. And she'd be like, take out the sarcasm. And, uh, and, and we did that and we would pass around and, and always, so I mean, if we always stuck with the facts and we weren't excessively harsh and it was just part of the conversation, then I think that lowered the level of risk. So I, I do think taking sort of the more Gandhi, Martin Luther King, love the opposition approach, as opposed to the Saul Alinsky, you know, get them, get them mad at you approach, I think that, that helps a lot. And I think, um, I mean, APA also, you know, their main uh, way of stopping us has been to, uh, I mean, I think I got more advantages from API. I think there are times where, um, there was one time when I was asked if I wanted to go to Switzerland for a substance abuse uh, trip. Um, I was asked by the science director. Um, and it seemed like, are they trying to buy me off? And then um, I said no to that one, but then I did go to one to meet the drug czar and represent APA. I still, I'm not an APA member, but I still work with APA and go and, with APA events, and I think their public interest director it does wonderful things. So it's also about, you know, not all of APA is bad, and not, certainly not all of psychology is bad. Uh, but it, those are tough decisions, absolutely. Hi. 
Um, over here. Oh, hi. So my question is, how do you think that um, these events have affected the trust across disciplines, and what does the APA and the psychology community at large need to do to regain that trust? So that's, that's a really good question. I do know that uh, I believe, well, a number of, of psychology associations throughout the world commented on the Hoffman Report. I believe the uh, sociology uh, program did as well. Um, I think probably the psychiatrists are really enjoying this. But, uh, but it's also the client's trust. I mean, we have, and, and whenever we talk about like a lawsuit against the APA, uh, there has to be evidence that it's harmed individuals and it's harmed the profession. And, um, and we do hear from a lot of, of clients who now have less trust about psychologists in general. And um, I'm not sure the APA realizes this. Um, and I'm not sure the APA is going to change in a way that will build that trust. And hopefully it will. But it's, it's, it's going to take ethics and it's going to take honesty. And, uh, and we'll see if, if, um, if they're able to change. Other questions? Hi there. I just had uh, one, probably not too quick of a question for you. I was just curious if you have any advice for graduate students, undergrad students, or new psychologists in how to face this issue across our discipline and how to comport ourselves a new, I think the will to knowledge has just been blind in and of itself, and I'm thinking now there's a new call for sort of a meta-ethical critique of our discipline itself. And how do we do that, and through what channels do we do that? Because I'm not totally sure that publishing in high-impact journals is the way to go. So I'm just curious if you have any advice for us. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I, I have learned from, I mean, I still like to, to publish in journals occasionally. Um, but, but the importance of, of blogs and letters and listserv conversations and um, other modes of communication, I think can really have a bigger impact than, um, than the, the, the journal article. And um, I, think, uh, I think you're right. We do need a, a, a metacognitive look at our ethics. We need to, when departments, when, when depart departments um, hire historians of different fields or ethicists, you know, and sometimes we don't even have full cla class courses on those, those topics. And, um, and all of that is going to be what's necessary. So, so the mechanisms, I think, again, I think, I think activism is something we need to uh, be better at, to, to do it with strengths, but also to be uh, critical and to, um, to make sure that, uh, that, that, that psychology stays honest. And I think, um, I think we can do that positively. I think we can use their rules, their ethical rules, their bylaws, to, to keep people to, to hold into their original mission. So that's, that's the hope. Other questions? I was just curious about the, um, the media's role. It sounds like they came in at the end. Um, as the fourth estate, they're supposed to be t sort of protecting us. Um, do you think they did enough for this issue? Were they there from the beginning, or it was only when they were alerted that it became an uh, issue? So, so they did come in occasionally. Smaller writers, um, uh, um, Vanity Fair, we had, we had a big success with, with them. Um, but they, I mean, they are going after what they think is strategic. And even with this Hoffman report, there's sometimes I wonder, uh, did the APA, or did, did Hoffman um, know that he was gonna be better off supporting the New York Times or, or the APA and that the New York Times um, trumped him, um, trumped the APA. Uh, so, the media has been very good lately, but but you're right. It has been it ha has been only recently, and um, and again, you know that that will probably fade away very soon. But uh, 
Um, we've had a lot of trouble. I mean, we've, we've had stories that we thought were going to be completely supportive, and then they came out and uh, were less so. So, yeah. Hey, I, I've got one for you, Brad. I'm just going to jump in um, since I've got the mic. So, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective on, um, you know, say I've taken your intro to psych class and I know how to uh, implement Milgram's obedience uh, stuff, right? Ex psychological stuff. Um, and I'm a, a, a James Mitchell of the world and the CIA is going to pay me millions of dollars to go do this work. Um, how can the APA, if we're targeting the APA, how can the APA incentivize me or prevent me from engaging in that work if I'm not a member and I'm not a licensed psychologist? So APA will often use that excuse. It's not a member, we can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, again, you're right, without the licensing, I mean, only cl clinical psychologists have that licensing, license to, to take away. Um, the APA could use more preventative forms of ethics they could stand up and say that we will su support whistleblowers, we'll su or we'll support those who abide by the ethics code and, and say no. Um, but in terms of accountability, uh, I, think, I think APA does see their ethics office as, as one of their forms of power, along with their accreditation. And, um, and it is a pretty weak mechanism. Um, uh, so it is true that, that they don't have that much power, but even in cases like Mitchell and Lesso, where they really could have done something and sent a message, they did not. And um, that's because they wanted the money and the power. So, um, but I think it's up to us to be watchdogs of the APA and uh, and keep them honest, and, and those individual psychologists. What do you think about the entry of the ACLU into this? I mean, what do you think that does to the dynamics, and what are the pros and cons for your cause? Well, I think this is, I think this is huge. So a number of the detainees are, are going after James Mitchell um, in court, and the ACLU is backing, backing them up. Um, the ACLU has always supported us, but this is, um, there are a number of times where James Mitchell's license uh, in Texas, there was a case where um, a group of human rights lawyers were um, trying to get his license removed and that fell apart. Um, so I just think we're finally getting to the point, I think the ACLU uh, could really be successful. I mean, if they're really behind this, I mean, I think it's, um, it's great, and I think APA um, has also critiqued James Mitchell, but it's kind of an easy, they've taken the sort of rotten apple argument rather than, this was before the Hoffman report. But um, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that court case can, can really switch things around. We've got a few minutes left, so I wanna take a couple more questions and then uh, we'll, we'll transition. Um, so a couple more questions. Charlie right here. Ah, sorry. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the responsibility within the institute, within academic institutions. You talked about how some folks were holding university positions. And I know certainly in Chicago, there are other members that were part of the Penn's task force and have some serious ethical issues in their actions. Some people who also self-identify as ethicists. And I'm wondering how you think, as we think of ourselves as an inter interdisciplinary community, how can others help us be watchdogs? What is the responsibility of the university itself, itself to hold people accountable when they're acting outside of their institutional role? That's right, so, so the, the, the dean of DePaul University, some of the APA quotes of the APA president that I gave you earlier, he is now at DePaul University as a dean. And uh, the students caught wind of this, the DePaulia magazine, uh, their, their newspaper has caught wind of this, and uh, the, our coalition actually, when uh, this individual was gonna be hired, we heard that he was interviewing at DePaul, 
and we wrote a five-page document saying this is against, I went to DePaul, so this was against Vincentian values, um, his, his actions, here, here was his actions, they hired him anyways. But now after the Hoffman report, there's 70 some mentions of this uh, dean in there. And um, so I've been in Chicago, been meeting with the student activists and uh, we've been um, strategizing and, and the president of the university just yesterday sent out a message saying that uh, he is behind the dean. Uh, he admitted to um, uh, bad behavior of the dean. He admitted to, uh, but he basically came up with the argument that that Saint Vincent de Paul was very much an activist and critiqued some other um, bishops. And uh, but when they when those bishops were punished or censured, um, Saint Vincent de Paul said, uh, um, "I don't like that." And so he says, "We're going to do that with the dean." We're um, mistakes have been made, um, and, and I just, I do not buy that argument. But I mean, it has been, I, the faculty is not going to give up. It's been the psychology people who have been the biggest defender of the dean, and it's been people from English and political science and sociology and philosophy, the faculty members and students, who have really been standing up and saying, no, we need, we need to really focus on this. So that's another battle that's going to be going on. But I do think, you know, I, I feel for forgiveness. I never like the idea of people getting fired. But I mean, honestly, there does need to sometimes be some accountability. And um, I mean, that's a really tough one. But it's important. And it's all of our responsibilities. We'll uh, take one more question. Um, my question is, oops, earlier with um, comparing community psychology to the APA, one of the things you're talking about is shaping of values, and you can see that the values of the APA, it's not really driven by values, um, similar to the militaristic use of psychology, so what are important values that are applicable to psychologists that, instead of like the concept of values? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think community psychology is exact because APA has been pretty value free, certainly on this issue. I think community psychology essentially was a rejection of typical traditional psychology. We need, you know, if we only did one on one uh, therapy, we're not going to really um, put a dent in all the problems people are facing. If we just stay in the laboratory and we don't get out in the community, um, that, that too is a disaster. So community psychology basically said, we're gonna do something completely different. So, um, and I, I think all of the principles of community psychology are, are very alternative to the APA, where the APA people are going. So rather than, I mean in the 60s we rejected psychology. Now I think we as community psychologists need to shape just like you're saying, we need to shape psychology itself in the form of community psychology. I mean, that, that would be my big hope. So, uh, so kind of a takeover and get them all to, to realize the values of, um, of non-hierarchical approaches, the values of collaboration, um, not treating people as, as objects in the research um, but, but really following APA's ethics, do no harm, um, have responsibility to individuals and to society, not just what's good for the discipline. And I think the more we can do that in all of our disciplines, the more we're going to help bring about a, a, a better socially just world. So thanks, sir. Thank thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.